This is a short video about circuit blocks in SimSmith. Circuit blocks are one of the most powerful features with, that exist in SimSmith as they allow us to analyze circuits that would normally not be analyzable. The SimSmith circuit here shown is actually four circuits. If we look closely, we see a generator, a load, another generator, a load, another generator, a load, and finally one more generator and a load. All the loads are 10 plus J0. All the generators are one watt, 50 ohm source. I've demonstrated the same circuit being, being synthesized via four different methods. The first method is shown on the left here. We start off with a, it's a standard high pass T network. We start off with a 10 plus J0 load. We add a capacitor, series capacitor, shunt inductor, series capacitor, as shown in the arcs here, and we get to 50 plus J0. Very, very standard, very, very understandable. Originally, um, I don't know if Sim Smith came with the F block or not, but before I was involved with Sim Smith, the F block existed. The F block stands for function block, and it, and it has a construct that looks like the following. We deal with impedances in an F block. I is the impedance at the left side of the, of the block. So I, in this case, will be 10 plus J0. We add to I the impedance of a capacitor of this value. That quantity we put in parallel with an inductor of this value. That quantity we put in series with a capacitor of that value. So if we compare that to the first circuit, we started with 10 plus J0. If we were to look at the impedance here at, at A, we would say that that is 10 plus J0 plus the impedance of a capacitor A. Then we put those two, that value in parallel with this inductor B. We take that value and put in series with this impedance of this capacitor C. Well, capacitor A is C antenna. Indu component B is the shunt inductor. And component C is the transmit side capacitor. So if we do this, this circuit ought to, sim and we use the same values, of course, as we used in the first circuit. The circuit ought to have the same, same result. Let's look at it. If we look at the circuit, we see the same result, starting at 10 plus J0, ending at 50 plus J0. Very cool. However, we don't see the arcs. We don't see the arcs for an obvious reason, and that is that the circuit that's comprised within a block can be so complicated that the arcs don't make any sense, and rather than just coming up with some kind of goofy arcs, a straight line seems like the most logical thing to do. So, again, the F, the F block looked like these, like, like a group of impedances. Let's just leave that here. Let's bring up the next block. The next block is an N block. N stands for netlist. The netlist block consists of two ports, port on the left side, port on the right side that are defined in the block. The port on the left side, I have chosen to make the upper terminal labeled W1, the lower terminal labeled ground. On the port 2 side, I've chosen to make the upper terminal labeled W2, the lower terminal la labeled ground. Since these two lower terminals have the same name, they're inherently connected, which is what we want for this circuit. We connect a capacitor of value C antenna from W1 to some new node that's somewhere in the middle here. We have an inductor that we connect from the, that new node to ground, just like this inductor. We have another capacitor, the transmit capacitor, that we connect from that new node to this side of the uh, network netlist block. This ought to simulate, again, if we use the same component values, ought to simulate the same circuit as the F block. Let's remove the F block's path, and there's the end block showing exactly the same, um, same circuit. Well, the end block is very interesting and, and quite valuable. However, some people find it a little cryptic. And the end block does not require me to understand how the impedances all add and, and combine as I go, go across the block. The net list just requires me to sit down on a piece of paper, if I wish, draw a circuit out, and then put those, put those um, uh, nets into this, into this list, and Sim Smith will take care of the rest. Well, a while later, uh, the newest block came about. It's called the ruse block. 
Ruse stands for Really Ugly Schematic Editor. And it was a little bit uglier when it first started. It's not so ugly anymore. Um, this clearly looks like a schematic. You can clearly understand what it does. Uh, the, the paths are all curvy lines. It doesn't do straight lines. But you can still see that the drag and drop kind of works. And as I move components, I don't lose my functionality. Um, I can pick from these components, transmission line, uh, S parameter block, um, uh, the inductor, capacitor, and resistor type thing. Anyways, when I do when I do this, the ruse block is really nothing more than a front end to an end block. This piece here creates an end block that probably looks exactly like this, except for the fact that these node names are probably not probably. I'm sure they're different. But anyways, if we look at the ruse block now, close off the end block. We look at the ruse block. Once again, what do we see? The exact same circuit. All three of the all four of these circuits produced exactly the same thing. Now, why would I want to do any of this? Well, there's a lot of reasons, to perhaps, to want to do this. Number one is I only have a certain amount of limit for space for a circuit. Uh, no matter how big the monitor is, it seems like there's never enough room for the circuit. This circuit here took three blocks worth of width. I can certainly make the blocks narrower, and at some point in time, I can't read what I'm doing anymore. Um, I can always hover over something, and if you look up here, if I hover over it, it tells me what it, what was actually hovered over, but it's not quite as quick or as convenient as actually being able to read it. So anyways, if you don't like the fact that the, the circuit's too big, if you like, if you want the circuit to be smaller and don't want it to be too big, you can put the circuit in one of these blocks. Also, there's circuits that can't be built um, with these blocks, and we I'll show a few of those in just a second here. But the, the F block being first probably has the least probably interest in use. I believe they all can do the same thing. I know the end block and the ruse block can do the same thing. To me, I use the end block probably half the time. I use the ruse block about half the time. The end block has a definite advantage, and that is that I can come by here and I can grab the text and I can do control C and I can put it somewhere else, control V, and it's easy to move around and edit. The um, uh, ruse block does not allow me to do that. The ruse block only allows me to um, take this block and save it uh, via the file chooser to some place and then get it back again. Now that's still valuable, very valuable. Um, and the circuit's a little bit easier to understand, so people may like that better. Either one will do exactly the same thing, and there's no difference otherwise. So let's go to a little bit larger, um, more complicated uh, example here. And I was, I received a, a comment uh, about well, how would you simulate a Johnson matchbox? Well, Johnson matchbox, this, this is a simulation of a Johnson matchbox done in a ruse block. And the Johnson matchbox consists of, schematics published on the web, consists of a, um, again, we're running it backwards. So this is the transmitter side. This is the antenna side. Components are negative. Coefficient of coupling never is negative. We start on the transmit side through, a, through our link coupled coil, which is a few turns to a larger coil, which is labeled L1 here. We, we have a tuning capacitor, which is which are these two, they're ganged to a center tap. And we have a single capacitor here, which is a dual differential capacitor. So C2 and C3 make one capacitor such that when this capacitance increases, this capacitance decreases. Likewise, down here, same thing. And I guess that the coefficient of coupling here, 0.3 is probably maybe a little bit high I don't think it's that high, though. We get this kind of a matching range on 40 meters. Everybody knows that Johnson, Ma Johnson Matchbox's claim to fame is it matches higher impedances better. Well, this shows that. Also, there's comments made about the Johnson Matchbox that these um, bottom two parts of the differential capacitor aren't needed. If you look closely at this, I will, I will delete the connection to those two. Look closely at this matching range and watch in particular this little area we cannot match. This little area that we cannot match is because we cannot go to low enough capacitance values. So take away the first one, take away the second one. There we are. What we see here is that the rotation of the unmatched area moved a little bit, but the matching area really didn't change much at all. So the comments that people have made about these two components being unnecessary is probably correct. 
However, people make this statement that nothing changes when you take those out. Well, clearly something changed. So um, I'll put them back in again. And we're back to where we were. I was, should show that if we change the coefficient of coupling here, we can see what happens. As we increase the coefficient of coupling, the matching range gets less. As we decrease it, it gets larger. Uh, I don't really know what it real, like I said, I really don't know what exactly what it is. If someone has a donor match box and they want to uh, make some measurements on it, we can put the right values in. Uh, someday if I find one at a ham fest that's, you know, really cheap, I may do the same thing. I don't care if the case is beat up, but these these capacitor values are absolutely correct. The, the, the numbers are known on those, specs are known. I looked at pictures uh, to, to come up with the 10 microhenries and the 300 nanohenries. Based on coil diameters, these are pretty reasonable. So this is a pretty reasonable estimate of what the match box can do on 40 meters. Um, if we look closely again at, at, this, at this circuit, we see there's a lot of nodes in here. Uh, this, this node and this node are part of the output. This node and this node are part of the other side. But this node is not part of anything. Not, and this node is not and this node is not part of anything either. So these two nodes are new nodes, and we couldn't simulate those with any combination of any of these components over here. The other thing that's interesting is that the ruse block allows us to draw the schematic, but it does not put in all the details. Number one is it doesn't we don't put the, co the coefficient of coupling between these two coils in the schematic. We put them over here, kind of like you would have put them in an in block. As a as a uh, as a command, k0 is is coefficient of coupling, a coefficient of coupling. We're coupling between inductor l0 and l1 with value of coefficient of coupling k, and that's all documented in the. Um, uh, if you look at the, I think it's documented in the. It's, I think it's in the f block, uh, but it, or maybe it's the n block. But I'm, anyways, it's documented well in in, in the um, in the help if you need uh, need to know the format. I deliberately put these commands in here, not commands, these statements in here, and they force the list of parameters here to be the order at which they appear. If I don't do that, SimSmith puts them in the order at which, it, which it, it finds them in the circuit somehow. In an end block, it starts at the top of the circuit and works its way down and puts them in order that way. In the, in the schematic you draw, I think it's which ones that either you put on the circuit first or whatever. It's hard to say. Needless to say, if I do this, I can force the order to be the way I want. This command, this statement right here, is commented out, and it was just um, to show that CXX was the value of this capacitor down here. I was plotting it out. Uh, these parameters can be both data entry and they can be um, data output. Anyways, that's an example of another circuit that basically um, couldn't be done with the regular. Um, components that are exist in SimSmith. Uh, do a couple more here. Here's another one. This is a single box branch line power combiner comprised of four pieces of coax, all of them a quarter wavelength long, two of them 50 ohms, two of them 50 divided by the square root of two ohms, and we have an output port and another output port and a, and a um, balance port. It's interesting in this in this circuit the two output ports are next to each other. Usually there's the balance port is between them. If we look, close this down a little bit, what we see, let's see if I make this, make it watts, okay. What we see is we see one output is the load, that's this pink line. We see it's basically half a watt. Um, basic and basically the other um, the orange one here is the other is the power in component R1 of component A it's the R1 here, let me let me say it again better it's R1 in component A and we're looking for the looking at the power R0 is the balance port um, let's see what else Close that off. Um, here's a Wilkinson uh, splitter. 
two two done two ways done in a ruse block and done in an end block in a ruse block it looks like standard two quarter wavelength pieces of coax that are uh, 50 times the square root of two 100 ohm balance resistor load resistor uh, in an end block it exists and again with a similar structure um, in this case I kind of think this one's a little more readable uh, you know it's kind of your choice how you do it nevertheless uh, these blocks give us give SimSmith give SimSmith power that doesn't exist in uh, any other uh, Smith chart program that I know of and allow you to simulate things like balance uh, we did talked about power combiners and splitters tuners uh, pretty much any circuit you can come up with, which is an extremely cool feature of SimSmith. Hope you enjoyed this.